So 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 to 29. Um, yeah, shh, on the fall stuff, right? Um, sorry, you know, I, I'm, I'm ready for some good 60 degree weather and just keep it at that. Um, no snow. I didn't say winter, right? I said fall, but all right. So 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 to 29. And here's what it says. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they weren't, or they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too, too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as he, uh, his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has been taught you, abide in him. Wow, lots of stuff in there, right? Um, so we're just going to look at the first little bit. You know, talk about an urgency, right? He says, it's the last hour. It's the last hour. Now, this is a verse that so often today is used to, uh, well, propagate end time stuff, right? It's, it's the last hour. It's the end times. Be ready. But what did this mean? Was this a reference to an end of all days, the second advent of Christ that's yet to come? And if so, then how has an Antichrist come? Right? You know, he says that right from the beginning. Uh, let's go back. Where did the verse go? Um, as, you may have, as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Well, that doesn't make sense, right? If, if the Antichrist is what we consider that thing that'll happen at the end times at the rapture, like before the rapture, right? And, uh, you know, we, we look in it, uh, you know, we, we read, you know, the Bible in light of the news. And so I remember growing up and dad said that, you know, he had somebody in his church that believed that um, Ronald Reagan, uh, because, you know, all three names, what, Ronald Wallace Reagan, I think, right? Um, and that all three names had six letters in it. Therefore, it was 666. Um, and so Ronald Reagan was the Antichrist. Um, I know some well-meaning Republicans who thought Bill Clinton was the Antichrist. And uh, yeah, he's gone. Um, you know, Ronald Reagan's gone. Uh, we, but when we look for that Antichrist, we might be missing something, right? This reference wasn't about something that was to come. The last days here was used in light of how it was often used in the Old Testament. The last days in the Jews, they saw it as two ages. They saw two ages. They saw an age of evil and then the age to come of the Messiah. The age to come of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, he came. At his death and resurrection, he ushered in a new age. That was the beginning of the end times. It was the age to come of Jesus Christ. Yet John wasn't referencing an end of all days, the second advent of Christ. He would get to that later, right? But he was giving clues to a time of testing that was yet to come. Time of testing yet to come. Nero would persecute the church. Now, um, maybe there's something you don't know. In the Hebrew language, the, each letter has a numerical value. And guess what? 
Nero's name numerically was 666. There was a lot of code in the writings of John in those things. Not code as if we couldn't understand it, but code to a persecuted church that he was being cautious around. Read Revelations. We get into that and we'll see some of those things. But Nero would come and persecute the church. He was the one that after this time, you know, God had, God miraculously protected the church from great persecution until a certain time, until a certain point. And at that point, he allowed the devil, he allowed evil to seek to break the church. That was the persecutions. Nero, Diocletian, so many. Nero caused a fire and then blamed it on the Christians to expel them, expel them out of Rome. Diocletian would continue a few hundred, about a hundred years later, right, and really persecute the church. John was speaking more about what would happen in Jerusalem than he necessarily was in the end of days. But yet we often read this passage and people go, oh, see, th this, is, this is it, the end of time. The Antichrist is coming. Well, you know what? There's something about that word. Antichrist was not, in, in this passage, not just a person. Not just one person, right? Or, or, or even many people, right? It, it was He was talking about it as a spirit. It was in a spirit that was anti-Christ. A spirit that spoke against Christ, that fought Christ. It, it was those that were against Jesus Christ. Look at verse 22 again, right? Um, it says, Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. That's the Antichrist. Not something that would come. He's speaking of something that was happening right then and there. They were there and even here now in churches and in our world around us. You realize John was the only, only biblical author to use the word Antichrist. And guess what? It's not in Revelations. Read through Revelations. We have interpreted it that way for the last hundred years in the American church, but it's not the historic way. In Revelations, there's not a mention by this term, Antichrist, but we have added it. We've included it in our readings sometimes, in our thinking. John was the only biblical author to use that word and it wasn't in his revelations. John shows us there are many, not just one Antichrist, that it's a spirit of the world. Anti would mean against, against Christ. We have, well, we have lots of Antichrists even today that are against the church, that are against Jesus Christ. We have people within churches that are against the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are in essence, Antichrist. Does that mean that we need to go around and label everybody as Antichrist? No. No. John didn't go through the list of, hey, this person, this person, and this person. He said, just, here's what you need to know about them. They deny the Father and the Son. Yeah, avoid them. Yeah. In fact, they've left. Right? The, the anti means against, not another, or instead of, right? We, we use it as instead of sometimes, meaning an antichrist is one who steps in. And so in Revelations, it says that there will be one, the abomination that will stand in the temple and declare themselves God. Well, guess what? Nero did that. He did. If you go back in history, Josephus even includes it. Um, Nero stood in the temple and declared himself God. Countless others have declared themselves God. Emperors, kings, rulers. <laughs> Anti didn't mean another, another Christ, 
a false Christ. It meant anti, against. They were the teachings, the movements that substituted a different message from the word of God. They go out from the church, but are not with it. Did you catch that? These are ones, verse 19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. We've seen those individuals, even right now in our world, there is a movement towards this progressive Christianity. And they want to say that the historic Christian belief is all wrong. The belief of their grandparents and parents was wrong. And they're, they're fighting against it. They're, they're dealing with this tension of, do I love my friends who are in sin or do I follow the rules of God? And instead of having a merger of going, yeah, I can do both. I can love and speak truth. They're like, but how, how, I mean, truth is relative. And just because I think, you know, because you think that the Bible says this doesn't mean that they believe it. And since they don't believe it, it must not be true. I mean, it's not an absolute truth because an absolute truth, I mean, by right, if it's absolute, everybody ought to believe it. Well, not really. <laughs> but the issue is in that progressive Christianity they're so annoyed and full of even hatred towards their fellow believers that many times they've left the church. Instead of sitting in the church, discussing with people, helping to learn and to grow and to teach and to train, they leave the church. They went out from us. There's a spirit of antichrist and a movement in our church today. There was a spirit of antichrist at one time when it came to church growth movement that split churches because, well, we need to be all about planting new churches. And they did so without revitalizing the old. There's a spirit of antichrist when we think that it's all about evangelism and we must split from the church because the church doesn't care about that enough. Those are all spirits of an antichrist that we allow in that preach a different message from the word of God. They go out from the church, but are not with it. It's division, not unity. And it's abounding even now. Yet, he gives us hope. He says, you have an anointing. Those who are in Christ, we have an anointing. We have an anointing from the Holy One. Four times in just two verses here, he uses this word anointing. You have an anointing. We, we sometimes, in forgetting the work of the Holy Spirit, we forget that the Holy Spirit is to help the anointing on us. He was sent down to anoint us. Jesus was the anointed one from God, and we are joint heirs with Christ through the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the assurance on our lives. We thus are charged. Because of the anointing that's on us, we are charged to know the truth. And the truth will set you free. <laughs> We're charged to know the truth and to teach the truth. Does that mean we all need to be Sunday school teachers or preachers? Or No, no. But we're called to know the truth. We're going to start a series starting Sunday on the Apostles' Creed. The nine sermons on the 12 phrases of um, dogmas in the church. We don't believe less than the Apostles' Creed in any denomination that is a Bible-believing denomination. We must know the truth. We have our Wednesday night group that started last night. Know what you believe and why. Speaking of theology and doctrines and um, discussing them, growing together in them. Why do we believe what we believe and why does it matter? How does that affect us? We are challenged because of the anointing 
and the call of God on our lives to be ambassadors, to be his witness into Jerusalem, Judea, and to Samaria and all the world, we are called because of our anointing to know to know what we believe, to know the truth and to teach it and to remain faithful to it. Do I always understand it all? No. That's okay. The Apostles' Creed, we're going to talk on Sunday, it begins with, I believe. (laughs) There's that great phrase, the individual comes to Jesus for healing and he goes, I believe, but Lord, help my unbelief. I believe you can do it, but ah, there's still a human side to me. I believe. We are called to know the truth, to teach it, and to remain faithful to it till the very end. Resist the lies that challenge who Christ was, who he is, and what he did on the cross and will do at the end of days. There are those that want to, I recently read uh, of an individual in the Presbyterian church who he's not a part of the main Presbyterian church. Okay, don't, this isn't a pigeonhole them all, right? But he is a part of that Presbyterian movement and he takes the core doctrines and says, well, they don't exist. Jesus really wasn't real. He didn't really, he, he might have been a martyr, but he didn't rise again, and he just immediately breaks away at the Apostles' Creed. We must resist the lies. The lies that challenge who Christ was and is and what he did. Because if Christ, and Paul even said, if Christ did not rise from the dead, then we believe in vain. We have a false hope. No wonder it's not changing our lives, right? <laughs> You don't understand the anointing. This group that John was fighting against denied that Jesus came in the flesh. They denied that he came in the flesh. Some even denied the divinity that Jesus was son of God. You want to know a litmus test to any Bible-believing church. Ask them their view of Jesus Christ. Who was he? Is he the eternal Son of God? Always was, always is, always will be. Or is he just some highest created, the first created being? That's a heresy. Is he the eternal son of God or not? It matters. All churches rise and fall on their doctrine of Jesus Christ. And this group was fighting and denying that Jesus came in the flesh. There was this group that actually said that, well, the flesh and matter is evil. You can't be. You you can't be. Um, You know, you can't. Jesus couldn't be flesh. God couldn't be flesh. And so they actually, if they had the term, would have said Jesus was a holograph. (laughs) They didn't get it. All denominations, all churches rise and fall in their belief of who Jesus is. Was he just a, a good person? And then at baptism, you know, that at baptism, when John the Baptist baptized him and the Holy Spirit came down, that's when he became divine. No. Because there are those that believe that too. He became divine then, but then the divinity left him on the cross. No. Sorry. Jesus is God. Always was, always is, always will be. So what do you believe about Jesus? And why does it matter? This is why things like the Apostles' Creed matter. The Apostles' Creed. So important in our lives. I'm digging for it here. I have it over here on my desk. On this view of Jesus. 
so important that it has one, two, three, four, five, six. Half of the statements of the Apostles' Creed had to do with Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. What we believe in Jesus matters. Anti is a spirit of against Christ. May we be careful that that spirit does not grow in us. Believing things that aren't biblical. Believing things that aren't of the word of God. So Heavenly Father, we pray that you would keep us for that coming age. We are in the last days. Jesus came to establish a new kingdom, to break the kingdom of evil and set up your kingdom, a spiritual kingdom. It was set up when Satan's power was defeated on the cross and when the power of death was broken in the resurrection. He was inaugurated when the Holy Spirit fell in power at Pentecost and it still is alive in even us. But Satan still is a dying animal seeking to devour, to distract, to divide. May we hold to, hold to the truths of the word of God, not fall sway to the emotions, the feelings. So God, direct us, guide us, lead us in your path. May we not get caught up in statements like the Antichrist, seeking only one person, but really read these in context and see that it is a spirit. It is an attitude. God, speak in us. Speak to us. Reveal yourself to us every single day, we pray, so that we might become more and more children of our Heavenly Father, growing in our love for you and our love for others. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen. Amen. Well, go in peace, and I pray you have a great rest of the afternoon.